Hi, I'm Tim Nesmith, Ship Superintendent for the USS Kidd. Welcome to Dry Dock Number 6 in Thomas C. Shipyard, where we are conducting the dry docking of USS Kidd. A lot of people have had questions about our primary reason for being here in the dry dock, which is hull work. What are we doing to the hull? So, let's take a look. One of the things that we did early, I think in September of 2024, was we had a side scan survey done of the hull, which is little robots using ultrasound crawling all over the hull and determining the thickness of the metal. Now, original build, the average thickness for this hull, and it changes depending on where on the ship you're at, the average thickness was 3 eighths of an inch. You might have some that's a little thicker, some that's a little thinner. Uh, some, the areas that really surprised us is really thin and was original build. Uh, but the average is 3 eighths. So as these robots go through, and they scan it, we determine the current thickness and we compare it to what it originally should have been. And that's gonna be important, the original versus the current. One of the things that we've discovered and that you've seen um, as we've go, gone along, you see in the old videos, you see markings all over the hull and they're all relating to the location and to the thickness. So if you look here, you see the FR 166, 65, 64, 163, 2, 1, et cetera. That's our frames. That's the ribs of the ship. That's the support structure inside that allows that metal to conform and make this shape, uh, just like your rib cage. Um, and you can see some of those right here. These are the ones going this direction. And you can see them going all the way down. The ones going laterally with the ship are the longitudinals. And again, more framework, uh, and that supports the length of the hull. These support going to either side. So it's a nice little grid work that gives your ship its form and its strength. So that's what the little FR and the numbers are whenever you're walking along the hull and you see in our videos all the markings. The other markings have to do with the thickness of the hull. And you see clad all up on the hull. And that's one of the repairs that we're using. Uh, we're using a bunch of different methods to repair her. Clad all refers to clad welding. And what clad welding is, if you find a divot, which we can see some divots up here on the hull, little craters, and that's just wear and tear from the ship from the years in the salt water uh, when she was in service. Clad welding takes a little divot like that, a little crater, and let's just say the gap in my fingers here is a crater. And the welder comes in and he lays a bead of welded material and lets it solidify and then comes in and lays another layer and another layer and another layer until he builds it up to the same level around that crater. And now that's all solid metal, all welded together into one piece. And then he takes a grinder and he grinds it smooth. And you can see up here, in these rusted areas or discolored areas uh, amongst the zinc coating. These were, di were divots, craters, that they have done clad welding on and got it back to original thickness. Some of these craters have penetrations through them that occurred when we blasted the hull. And that's one thing, when you start blasting a hull that's been in the water for a long time, you're gonna find stuff under the paint that you didn't even know about because the paint was hiding it. And that's what happened in a few of these cases. In fact, hold them this way and I'll show you a couple of those, actually three of those. If you look at this clad all up near the water line, then you see right near the second L, there's two penetrations. And then over to the left of the clad all, there's another penetration just behind frame 145. Now those penetrations, offer something of a challenge because you don't just want to clad around them. What you want to do is you want to crop out to good metal, find good thickness, crop those out, and then take and put new metal in. And so it's a little small piece, maybe about this big, uh, just to get to good metal and you plug that in weld it up, grind it smooth, and you're all good to go. Now our touch points for the cradles offer a completely different spin on that crop and renew uh, repair feature. So let's go take a look at one of those. So this is one of our touch points. We'll show you some video 
overlapping my ugly mug and you'll see what the touch points looked like when we first got into dry dock. And some of them were just as ugly as my mug. They sat on the rubber blocks of the cradle for 40 years. Uh, kid would float, then she'd sit back down on them. The last time kid was dry docked was 1962 in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. And that's when she last had hull work like this done to her. Well, when she came to Baton Rouge, She's sitting in the cradle when the river's down. We can't lift this ship up. We can't move the concrete blocks the way the shipyard can move these wooden blocks. And when the ship's afloat, if you watched our rudder videos, cue the link for the rudder, you'll see that we're talking about how the divers, when they were working on the rudder, had zero visibility. And you can't do this sort of hull work in that sort of visibility. So this is why, one of the reasons we had to come to dry dock. But you can see here they have replaced, they have cropped out that wasted deteriorated metal that caused all of our problems with the leaks. And we've got good metal here now, but they haven't finished welding here yet, but they will take and continue welding and seal it up, grind it smooth, and it'll be like you never even saw it. But what they're doing before they put this metal on is those same frames and longitudinals we were talking about if the ship has any play whatsoever, six inches or whatever, in the docking collars that hold us in place in the Mississippi River, then potentially the pad could shift just slightly one way or the other in either direction, forward aft, port starboard. And that potentially could cause problems. And we did find a few spots where that did cause problems because it landed the impact area landed on an area where it was just the skin of the ship and not a frame, just by a few inches, but it made a difference. So what the shipyard is doing, Thomas C is going in after they've cropped this out and they're adding um, extra support. They're adding a new rib. They're adding a new uh, a frame, a longitudinal right in this area to better support. So no matter where the pad shifts on this touch point, it will always impact the skin and a structural support behind it. There will never be a point to where it will be able to cave in an area of that touch point again. And that is extremely important. So somebody in the comments section of one of our videos recently asked a very good question, which is when they're doing this cropping and renewing and they're putting new metal in, how do they make a flat sheet of steel conform to the curvature of the hull. Now, I'm not a shipwright, I'm not an engineer, I'm a history teacher, but I was able to get the guys to explain it to me and I'm gonna explain it to you in the most elementary of terms so that everybody understands it because honestly, when they get into the higher elevation, I don't understand it either. It all revolves around a battening stick. This is not a battening stick, but this is my best approximation of how one works. So your battening stick is flexible as I'm flexing this. And what you do, it starts with the structural supports that they're putting up in there. Those are sitting in there welded in and they are straight as they you know, were constructed in the forge and they get their battening stick, and because it's flexible, it'll curve. I'm not tall enough to touch it, but they can make it curve with the same curvature of the hull, and they bring it up against that frame or that longitudinal, and they mark it. And once they've marked it with that curve from this battening stick that matches the curve of the hull, then they can shave that piece of steel to the curvature to match that that uh, that curvature, that's redundant. I know. Um, then, when you get your plate, you put your plate on, you weld it, and as you're pushing upward, you come to a to a uh, structural member that they have conformed with the curvature of the hull, and you weld to that structural member. And then, using pressure, sometimes heat, but most of the times pressure you are bending the steel up to meet the next structural member and weld it to that point. And then they're welding along the curves, uh, along the edges as well. And you just pressure up to meet that, that next structural member that's been matched up with the curvature of the hull, weld, pressure, weld, pressure, weld until it conforms now with the hull. And then you seal up the outer edges, which this one is still remaining to be done.
battening stick. In addition to putting the added structure underneath the skin of the ship at a touch point, they are also making sure that the skin that goes back in place on the outside is a little bit thicker than what was around it. So not only do we have added structure under that skin, but we got a thicker skin at that touch point where it gets wear and tear. So very important for the folks that are taking over from us in the future. We've talked about clad welding. We've talked about crop and renew for the little penetrations for the craters and divots. And then we've talked about the touch points. We're gonna go talk about our third piece, uh, third technique. Uh, so follow me this way. And you can see as we go, all these touch points along the hull, there are 22 touch points on the upper sides of the hull, which you're seeing right here, uh, 11 pairs, basically, uh, 11 on each side, starboard and 11 on port. And these provide stabilization so the ship doesn't roll when she sits in the cradle. It just lets her slide right into the cradle. And there are 44 sets of three pads going down the length of the keel from skeg to stem for after four. And those triplets, 44 of those triplets, is what bears the entire weight of the kid when she's sitting high and dry in the cradle. And you can see they've done almost all of these and completed them. So we are almost done with the touch points. A few spots still left. When you get up here, this is our third issue. And the third issue is what happens when you either A, have enough of these divots to where the entire plate is compromised, or what happens even if you don't have craters on it, what if near the water line, which is a little bit further up than this, this section you see here, what if that plate, just through wear and tear, has thinned down over the years? Remember, three-eighths of an inch is not a lot. So what if it gets thin enough and you have to replace the whole plate? Well, in the case of the, in the, case of the divots, if the whole plate is compromised, they're pulling the whole plate off and they're replacing it with like material. Uh, so a, let's say a three-eighths plate gets replaced with a three-eighths plate. A seven-sixteenths plate gets replaced by a seven-sixteenths plate, and so on. So some of these plates, particularly near the waterline, are getting replaced. Uh, up near the bow, you can see past me here, uh, you had a lot of clad welding and you had a couple of plates that just needed to be replaced because it was, the plate itself was too compromised. So they pulled it out, they put a new plate in. Now, some people out there may be really surprised that we're having to replace this much metal uh, on the hull of the ship. But remember, thin hull, 82 years old, a lot of wear and tear over the years, a lot of years in the salt water before she got to Baton Rouge. She spent 42 years in fresh water. The rest of the time has been in salt water. So half of her life was in salt water. Um, as an example, we're gonna put up some pictures uh, of some of our sisters in the historic fleet who've had hull work before us. Cass and Young in Boston, Laffey in Charleston, South Carolina, Turner Joy, in the uh, Bremerton area in Washington State. They all had hull work. Laffey had a lot of hull work on her last dry docking, and it's because of the salt water that she sits in. Same thing for Cass and Young. Cass and Young had plate removal, just like we did. And a lot of people, when we first put her in dry dock, when Molly and I were first walking through, literally an hour after they lifted her out and brought her over to the repair yard, a lot of people watching on the internet were saying, scrap her, she's, she's done for, because of all the growth that they saw uh, on the ship. They thought it was wear and tear, but it was, it was just silt and a little bit of, of uh, mossy type stuff. It wasn't anywhere near what people were thinking it was. And when you look at these pictures, particularly Turner Joy's picture, uh, you can see the sea growth that is just latched on, it looks like something out of a horror movie. I would not want to put my hand on that stuff at all. It's nasty. But that's the sort of stuff that you, that you see. And freshwater has a lot less of that. So Kid has been benefit, benefiting quite a bit from 
being in fresh water versus salt water. And we're not throwing any shade at our sister destroyers. They live in the environment that they live in. We live in the environment that we live in. Uh, some of us have pluses, some of us have minuses. So that's what we all have to deal with. Uh, but in this instance, you're seeing the area from our previous video where we talked about the reefer deck. Go look for Don't Fear the Reefer. And you will see us, what we're doing, we're cleaning out the insides of the reefer so that they can get and see what's in between. The reefer, literally, this is the area where the tank, where the uh, pumps were that Miss Molly showed you when she was coming down the ladder. After blasting, this hole popped up. And this was the last leak that occurred on our trip down. And then you come on the other side of the bulkhead right here and you can see the insulation we were talking about where the insulation was just nice and beautiful uh, and no condensation between the hull and the, the wall of the reefer. So this is, you're looking inside the central reefer and the starboard reefer. Uh, and this whole plate just proved to be too compromised, too thin. And so they pulled the whole plate off and once they repair this and put the new plate in, then the inside wall of the reefer will be returned. The insulation will be returned and we're back to normal. And you can see right here where Molly and I are walking, these are the new plates that will be going in when they get ready to return to this section. One question you might have about what I was talking about with where the plates are being uh, replaced uh, more than others uh, is around the water line. And part of that is the wind water line is where all the friction comes from when the ship is underway. It's where the waves are slapping repeatedly. It causes just wear and tear on that metal and it gets thin. Every ship, when they go into dry dock, they look at the wind water line. And that area is nine times out of 10 where you're gonna see the most damage. So that's part of the reason why you'll see so much near our waterline that's being worked on. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've found that it is helpful to you to understand what we're doing with the kid and why this is gonna make her longevity so much better and not just another 10 years down the road or 15 years down the road, we have to come back. This will get us a couple of decades minimum down the road, maybe even more maybe another 40 years before we have to come back. It all depends on how well we do the job here and now. So thank you for your support. Uh, please press the subscribe button, press the like button, share it with people you think would be interested and go to USSKid.com and press uh, the donate button and throw some money. Every bit of money that you throw at that donate button is going into these projects. We appreciate it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.